Well, hello. It's a day of discombobulation here in the van from somewhere deep within the bowels of Maine. As you can probably hear in my voice, whatever I picked up in Albania and brought back to the United States, I am not quite over that yet. And uh, like a good American, the first thing I did was give it to a family member. And so I feel good about myself. I've got a uh, kind of a weird, yes, I'm in the van. I'm somewhere in Maine. I did a film like this last year when I was here called What Did We Learn or What Else Did We Learn? <clears throat> this is the V2 redo, redux version of that film. Random points just for the hell of it. I haven't made a film in a while and I'm kind of jonesy. I'm kind of antsy. I don't, my, my Albania film, I haven't even started to build yet. And it's kind of daunting when I think about it. And I'll probably chicken out and cop out and make something really dumb and short. But you know me, that's my style. So I've got random points to talk about here, but before I go, I, before I go, you see, my brain, I don't know, I tested myself for COVID three days in a row, tested negative, but those home tests are not good. Anyway, uh, I did a run yesterday. I ran for about 35 minutes. I survived. I did a almost 30 mile bike ride the day before. I was fine. So I don't think I have COVID. But I don't know. And now my uncle-in-law has it, thanks to me. Because I'm a giver, people. You should know that by now. It's, I'm sitting on something very uncomfortable. So this is a film about 10 random things. But I think they're kind of poignant. But before I do that, before I get to these points, and yes, I'm sitting here with my black-framed Fuji Instax, waiting to start journal number three of this trip. And uh, I'm not going to say it. Not gonna say it, not this time. Not gonna say anything about my space pen. Nothing, there will be nothing said about the space pen. I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna teach you how to lie. Lying can be fun. Lying can be done for sport. It can be done for strategy. It can be done because you're up against it and you think something horrible's gonna happen and you have to lie to get your way out of it. It's a skill. Lying takes practice. And I am always infuriated and let down and depressed and demoralized when I see someone in a position of power who does not know how to lie. So for me to teach you how to lie, I've got to start with an impression, okay? And I'm not good, I'm not, I'm not good at impressions, but I think you'll be able to know who I am. All right, the, the, here's how we begin. Who am I? Did you or did you not speak to the president on January 6th? <clears throat> Well, I, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I talk to the president all the time. I mean, you know, I, um, I, uh, you know, I don't know why people keep asking me this. I was like, yeah, I talked to him that morning, but I don't know. I'd have to go back and check my notes. And I, I you know, I don't know. Maybe I did. I, 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 I always talk to him. Like, why would I not? I have a chance to talk to him. I might have talked to him that morning. Maybe I did. I think I did talk to him, but I don't know. I don't have my notes, but I did. Maybe that afternoon. I don't know. Why do people keep asking me that? All right. For those of you who don't know, that is a member of Congress who probably gave the most glaring, horrible, lie-laden interview I've ever seen in trying to deny that he spoke to the president on the morning of January 6th and the afternoon of January 6th. It was horrible and so clear that he was not telling the truth. And he's done this over and over again. Now, I look at that and I go, yeah, he's a stooge, but I can help. Because if you wanted me to lie, or let's say that you were paying me to lie even better, this is what I would have done. Did you or did you not speak to the president on the morning of January 6th? First of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate any time I get a chance to talk to anyone in the world of journalism. I think journalism is critically important to the culture and fabric of our society today. I'll have to check my notes. Stand by. Oh, here they are. By the way, he could have fabricated those notes this morning and no one would have known. Yes, I talked to the president on the morning of January 6th. Look, I'm in a position of political power. I'm a, I'm a member of the American Congress, the United States Congress, which means I have power and influence, but it pales in comparison to the commander in chief. So anytime I get a chance to talk to the commander in chief, I take that opportunity. And oh, by the way, the first thing we spoke about was policy. I am a politician that is based on getting policy passed, which is a total lie, by the way. None of these people do any policy anymore. And what we first talked about was education, because if we don't fix our education system, America will be completely overrun. Whoa, the sun's shining off the hood of the car. Look at that. America will be overrun 
by legions of dumbasses, like it is today, but it will get even worse. So, thank you for asking. Uh, and yes, I did. I spoke to the president after the events, the terrible insurrection, the violence that was in great part brought on by the president. Yes, I spoke to him that afternoon as well. And again, I said, you've got to call this off, blah, 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 blah. You see where I'm going here? There's a skill to lying. You're welcome. We're sorry. The number you have reached is not in service. Please check the number or try your call again. This is a recording. All right, let's move on to these points, people. Uh, I mentioned this in my podcast. This is point number one. I figured out how to save the world, and uh, I don't even want credit for it. It would be nice to happen. And that is, number one, is we have to collect all of the smartphones. We're going to collect everybody's smartphone, and we're going to give you something in return. It's going to look a lot like the smartphone you have now, but it's only going to have... I said earlier it's going to have two features. I'm actually going to add three because someone else pointed something out to me that I thought was pretty valid. Literally, the sun is coming in and out, and it's shining off the hood of my van, which is up so the rodents don't get in. I can't win. Cannot win when it comes to making films. We collect the smartphones. We give you back a device that only has GPS. It works as a phone. And the third thing that someone was nice enough to point out to me is, yes, you can have your music on the phone, but there's no internet, there's no social, there's no buying apps, there's no fitness apps, there's no nothing. We have to take our species back from the smartphone. We will not survive. Albania, where I just was, suffered through 50 years of total communist dictatorship isolation. No in, no out, public being surveilled. That was rough. That was really rough. When you go to Albania today, the impression that I was left with is communism was tough. It was rough on a lot of people, but tourism and the smartphone is going to prove probably equally as dangerous to the population. What if I do this? Maybe a little bit, just a little, just a little touch, a little touch up. Tourism and the smartphone, they will be lucky to make it through. It's, it's rough. It's tough out there. It's not good. That's number one. By the way, I drove here across the country. The public bathroom situation has not improved. I would say it's probably gotten worse than it was before. Okay, when the person made the comment about leaving music on the phone, all right, that's it, I'm putting the hood down, hang on. All right, I'm back. Also lowered it a little bit. Kinda, I don't know, kinda got this all going. When the person said to me, hey, you should allow the phone, the device that we give back to people after collecting all the smartphones. It should have music on it. I was like, you know, I don't talk a lot about music. And I actually don't listen to a lot of music. I love music. I love house music, ambient, dub, deep, dark, Danish dub music. I love pretty much anything except country music. Country is where I draw the line. And uh, I can't go there. But everything else I like. I really like music. My brother, lifelong guitar player, music is probably outside of his family and his job. Music is the centerpiece of his life. Me, not so much. But I do like music. And when I listen to music, I like music that instigates. Music that pulls me or physically forces me to go in one direction or another. And I wanted to tell you a little story because I heard a song the other day that reminded me of this. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. 1987, I graduate from high school. I end up Texas A&M at Galveston on a merchant marine ship off the coast of South America. And there's this guy where I'm stuck in a room that doesn't even have a portal. It's in, it's like one of four rooms that's in the center of the ship. Horrible. It's worse than you think. It's supposed to be four guys in the room. There's actually five because the boat is overcrowded. There's a guy strung in a hammock between the bunks. It's awful. It's pitch black. You shut the door, you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's either stifling hot or freezing cold. It's loud. It's awful. It's hellish. It was so dark and I would be so discombobulated when I woke up. My alarm was right at my head. There were times where I could not find the alarm in the dark. I was so out of it. Anyway, one of the guys on the ship is from Amarillo, Texas. One of the guys in my room. We all have our head shaved. We're wearing uniforms. It's miserable. And he has brought a grand total of three cassette tapes on this ship, which were on for like four months. The Smithereens, Midnight Oil, and then the last one, he has the cassette, and it's still in the cassette holder, the plastic holder. 
and he and he's rattling it like the guy in war at the end of Warriors with the beer bottles. Warriors come out and play, and he's hitting the bottles together. But he's doing that with the cassette tape, and he says something to the effect of, "You may want to sit down for this one." He pops out the cassette, he puts it in the ginormous cassette player, and he hits play, and it's an album called Electric from a band called The Cult, which none of us had heard to that point in time. Even though The Cult had prior albums, he didn't have those albums. He had Electric. Electric was the album that put The Cult in mainstream. And I was blown away. And The Cult instantly rocketed to the top of my list of music and bands. And I still love The Cult today. A few short years ago, I was able to actually meet the man god that is Ian Astbury, the lead singer of the cult, who is the coolest, most down-to-earth, normal guy. Um, and we had a great conversation. I thought it would be like a five-minute, hello, nice to meet you, love your music kind of thing. And we ended up talking for several hours. Great guy. I heard a song of theirs two days ago, and I stopped what I was doing, and I just looked around for something to break because that's what good music does. And that's all I wanted to say about that. Point number two. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Having just returned from Albania, I will say this. This is what we've what else we've learned. Travel today is possible. It is. It's not pretty. The airlines are a disaster in great part. The airports are a disaster in great great part. Uh, Heathrow, I've never seen anything like it in terms of apparatus not working, unhappy workers, long queues, crazy. The only reason we got through Heathrow was my wife pulled off. An, an incredible move to get us past a three-hour queue that was just a transfer queue, not including this, the uh, queues for the buses that weren't working, the train that wasn't working, the security that was understaffed. It was brutal. We got through thanks to her. She gets a five star and a smiley face. COVID uh, Travel is possible, but COVID is raging in many parts of the world. And for whatever reason, we have failed. I would give humanity an F for the most part on how we handled COVID and how we're handling it today. Craig Maud, who as you've heard me talk about many times on this channel before and also on my website, Craig Maud is an American living in Japan. He's one of the most interesting creative people I know out there today. And Craig, uh, I got his email. I signed up for one of his emails. He has two or three. I get one and then every time I get one, I go into the site and figure out what else he's been up to. He recently just got COVID by traveling to the UK, and he wrote a very interesting piece this morning about getting COVID and how bad it was and how the world has given up in comparison to what his life is like in Japan when it comes to COVID. And it's a really well-written piece. He's a great writer, bookmaker, photographer, uh, super savvy on the tech, and also just a good designer as well. So his site looks, looks great, but his piece was about COVID. The Tour of Swiss cycling event right now, decimated, blown apart by COVID. Wimbledon just lost a third uh, top seed on the men's side today. My guess is a lot more people have it. Uh, there was an event in Boston two nights ago that was canceled because every single cast member has COVID. For those of you out there who think this is over, it is not. It is not remotely close to being over. In fact, I think the numbers in the United States right now are inching towards as high as they've ever been. The problem is that no one's testing. So even though the, the public official announcement is 100,000 new cases a day, some are reporting that the cases are probably 30 times higher because no one is testing anymore. Those 100,000 are the people who have engaged with the official medical system and the 35,000 who are in the hospital because of COVID. And by the way, this is the insult to injury part, and this is what Craig writes about uh, so eloquently. This is not just a cold for a ton of people, including him. And he talks about a specific side effect, and I'm not gonna give away the secret story here. He talks about a specific side effect with him that is not cool in any, any way, shape, or form, and also talked about the severity of the disease even two weeks after he got it, I have other friends who are in their 30s and healthy who have long COVID who are having difficulty getting treatment because the medical system doesn't want anything to do with you. They don't even want anything to be labeled long COVID because then it comes with a, an insurance attachment. It comes with long-term risk that no one wants to pay for. So if you're one of those people who's ignoring it, you are part of the problem. The only way that we will get a handle on this is to be intelligent about it. 
That means wearing masks in public places when there are a ton of people, regardless of whether or not there's a mask mandate. It's pretty simple. You wear masks, the numbers go down. You don't wear your mask, the numbers go up. And I am sick and tired of looking at people and hearing people say, I can't believe it, I got COVID. I went to a concert the other night, 30,000 people inside and I got, I got COVID. Yeah, dumb shit, you did get COVID and you will. If you go in public, in a public place with tons of people, odds are you're gonna get it. It's the second most transmissible disease in our species history. And it's about time we woke up because, and this is where it affects everybody, regardless of whether you've had COVID or you think you want to get COVID. I don't know. Maybe you're like, I don't know. I'm feeling lonely. I need, I need, a, I need something else inside me that's, that's foreign born. It's crushing the business world. It's crushing our economy. You can't get paper. You can't get steel. Shipping containers went from $8,500 to $40,000 per. Why do you think that is? The airlines can't keep staff going. Sporting events can't keep staff going. Anytime you hear those things, that means employment for thousands and thousands of people. And all it took for us to do this the right way was to say, wear a mask. And we were babies and we couldn't do it. So suck it up and put a mask on. All righty then. Okay. What else did we learn? Number three. Wait, how much time we got? I got plenty of time. I got all day. I'm in the van. I'm starting to sweat, by the way. Photography, this is number three. Photography is a thing, right? We all know that. It's a thing that most of us on this channel really dig. We like photography, that's why you're probably here. Instead of my waxing poetic about random news events. Bookmaking is another thing. And bookmaking is a whole separate thing. It's a whole separate language. And the reason I'm telling you this is I just came back from Albania I taught two, co-taught two separate workshops. Elena Dorfman and I co-taught a workshop in the South. <clears throat> I took a week off to work for Blurb, and then we taught a workshop in the North. Each workshop's about a week long. The idea is you go into the field, we set the table with locations, ideas, places, boom, kick you out, you go. If you want us to walk with you, talk with you as you're working, fine. And if not, we do it later in the night, early in the morning. We start talking about editing and sequencing, and then we sit to make books. Bookmaking is a whole separate language of editing, sequencing, design, white space, typography, all of these things. I cannot stress to you how important this is as a photographer. Whether or not you end up hitting print or not, just going through the exercise is critical. And I'll give you an example. A couple of the students, one of the students in the class, said something along the lines of, you know, I signed up for this workshop, I really wanted to take it, but I always kind of thought like the bookmaking thing was a bit of a gimmick. Like, you know, whatever. That same person was like, it's not a gimmick. It's, this is like a, a whole nother level of considered thought towards the work to solve this puddle, puzzle. And he actually made a really interesting book, not with work from the trip, he actually was a film shooter. So he shot film the entire workshop and then brought a uh, other body of work that he'd been working on for a year that we sat and edited and sequenced and looked. That is something I gotta stress again and again and again. If you haven't done this, do it. And also I'm going back to Albania spring 2023 to teach two more classes. It looks like Peru end of 2023 sometime in the fall and then 2024 we could be looking at Lebanon, just a FYI, little heads up. Number four, journaling is really hard. So as you would, as you would guess, I was harping on students the whole time, like write, 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 write. You're walking down the street with someone who's Albanian, who's giving you a history of the day that Hosha died. He was in elementary school and he is going to school. And every, every day at school at that time, you had to pronounce the first thing you did in school was pronounce your allegiance to the supreme commander, who was Hosha, the dictator. And all of a sudden on this day, they didn't do it. And the kids are like, what is going on? And then the teacher came in and started crying. And then all the kids started crying, but they didn't know why they were crying. And then this kid went home and his grandmother said, Hosha died. And as he started, began to repeat the story, his grandmother said, uh-uh, don't say it. Because if it's not true, someone might assume that you're celebrating the fact that he's gone. He said they lived under that for a year. The reason I can tell you that story 
is because I wrote it down word for word while we were on the street. There was another student there who didn't. And then later when they were putting their magazine together, I was like, hey, you should, you know, use that conversation we had earlier. And they said, oh, I can't quite remember the details. So writing it down, journaling is really hard. Not for me, but for many of you. There's a couple pointers. Number one, I've been doing this every day for 30 years. I'm not joking. 30 years I have been writing every day in a journal. It is a skill, it is a reflex. Once you get to a certain point journaling, not doing it becomes the difficult part because there's this release that you get from it that you don't get any other way. And when you don't get it, you find yourself saying, I want that again. Also, this is in direct opposition to modern culture. This is not, my journal is not for you and your journal is not for me. It's not about sharing. This isn't about public gain. That, you know, there's a lot of scammers out there who want you to believe it is and their journal has to look a certain way and they're using 15 colored pens and every page has like a to-do list. That's a kind of a scam. That is to get you to think that that's what your journal is supposed to look like so you have to keep going back to that person. Look at my journal. This does not look that sexy, okay? It's 99.9% .9 written journal because that is the critical part of it. If you want to design art books, that's completely fine, but that's not a journal. So your journal is private. It's a, it's a free fire zone for your brain to do whatever the heck you want it to do. So just start. You have to do it. It doesn't have to look a certain way. You don't need a certain kind of journal. You don't need a certain kind of pen, like a space pen. You don't need that. It can just sit down and start and do it for two weeks straight. And my guess is you won't ever stop. Okay, number five. A little foreshadowing here, potential, it's a question. Who of you might be in Paris in November? Because it's looking more and more likely that Uncle Dan is gonna be in Paris in November. And I was thinking maybe there would be some sort of meetup opportunity, maybe even some sort of photographic opportunity. And oh, by the way, Perry Photo goes on which is the largest photo show in the world, goes on November 11 through 14. You also have Polycopies, which is the uh, show that's held on the barge in the middle of the river. That's the photo book show. You also have Photography Month. A lot of the galleries in Paris are filled with photography instead of art. Uh, it's a great time to go. It can be the most beautiful weather in the world. It can also be sub-zero. I've had both. Uh, I would be going to do all of the above. And so I'm just curious who out there is going to be in Paris in November. It's not 100% it's not for me, but it would be cool. And I pitched it officially. All right, point number six. What else did we learn? My bag fetish is not going anywhere. <sighs> Every day since I got it. I have carried this bag. I carried it on my bike yesterday on two different rides around town with camera gear in it because I was trying to look for a photo, which I never got. I used it every single day in Albania. It got beat to crap. It still looks perfect. I sweat through it every single day. Albania was hot. There were plenty of days that were around 90 um, humidity, so you're just completely soaked in sweat. The back of it, the whole top of it had salt rings on it from how much I was sweating. The bag is great. This is not going away. Two of my students on the trip had these bags called GORUCK, GORUCK GR1s, and this is what they travel only with these bags. It was amazing. We're loading stuff in and out of this van, and I look around and I don't see their luggage. And I'm like, uh-oh, their luggage is gone. And I very casually saunter over, hey, how's it going? How's your photography? I don't, how's your photography? How are things going? How's life? We lost your bags. Um, anything else? And uh, they were like, we don't have any bags. We just have these backpacks. And it was a really cool, ingenious system that they had. And this is nothing new. People have been traveling light forever. John Muir used to leave and hike for days with a bag of tea and a biscuit. Like, you know, talk about the, the lightweight traveler. But um, it was an interesting system because, again, the airlines are a disaster. The airports are a disaster. And so not checking, which I never check unless something weird happens. But again, very interesting. My bag fetish, I realize I just gave up to it. I'm going to keep, keep fetishing bags for the rest of my life. Number seven. Um, oh, this is going to rankle some people. This is going to rankle some thin skinners out there. But I think it's something you need to know. I've also got a camera fetish, which is also never going to go away. And uh, I don't think it should. Because again, 
I'm not a photographer anymore and uh, photography is kind of a part of my life, but not nearly like what it was. It probably never will be that again, which I'm fine with. But the cameras are something that are in my hands basically almost every day, whether it's for me, mostly for blurb or doing other kinds of things, my Sony, my Fuji kit, whatever. On this trip, one of, one of my students had the Q2 Reporter Leica. I was like, and I'd had that camera in my hand before, but never when I was in a photographic environment where other, you know, where the sole reason I'm there is for photography. And so he handed me this thing and I was like, I don't want to see that. Handed it to me and I was like, yep, this is a camera I want. That it was pretty immediate, like, okay, this works for me. So that kind of thing, the camera fetish, lusting what you don't have, you know, the Fuji cameras, and I've said this many times, ergonomically, best cameras I've ever seen. Uh, bang for the buck, best cameras I've ever seen. Great lenses, super smart designs and builds. Fuji's killing it. I love this stuff. I use it all the time for work, but I also shot Leica for 30 years. So there's something ingrained in me about how those Leicas feel, even though the Q2 is different from a rangefinder Leica, you know, classic rangefinder, but still it just is in the drop down menu. It just locked in the second I had it in my hand. Here's the thing that I want to uh, caution you about. There's a lot of people who are comparing the Leica Q2 and the Fuji X100. And that to me is ridiculous. Those are two cameras that are light years apart. I shot three frames with the Q2. I've had two Fuji X100s. I do not like the Fuji camera at all. I love my XTs. I think the X Pro is great. One of the students on the trip had the X Pro 3 and a 1614. That's a 24 equivalent. He killed it. He made great work, great magazines. He shot the same thing the whole time. That X Pro is a really nice camera. I've had X-T2s. I used that yesterday. I love that camera, the X-T4. I do not like the X100 cameras. I never have, and I've had two of them. You cannot compare that camera to the X, the, the X, uh, X, X2, Q2. Damn it. They are light years apart. The Fuji suffers. That X100 suffers with that small chip. There is no fall off on that lens. I hear people raving about this camera all the time, and then I see the work, and it's not good. Frankly, not good. And that may chafe some people. I don't care. For There's one or two people total in the entire time that that camera's been around whose work I saw and said, that's good work. Would it have been better with a Q? Would it have looked better? Yes, it would have. All the press guys that I knew that bought the X100s initially because they were tiny and small and they wanted them to work so bad. Everybody wants that camera to work because it's so small and so light and so inexpensive in comparison. The problem is it doesn't. It's okay for a snapshot camera, but it is not a Leica Q. It is not a 47 megapixel full frame 1.7 look. The X100 is nowhere in the ballpark. So if people are comparing those and trying to sell you on the X100 over the, the Leica, I think they are doing it for a reason. There is an angle they have that they're trying to sell you on. And yes, price point, absolutely. You could buy three, four, five of the Fujis for the cost of the Leica. I get it. But do not compare those cameras. Again, three frames with the Q. I was like, I want it. And that is no way, shape, or form an X100V. So that's my take on that. This is never going to change. What, here's what I want from Leica. And of course, they're listening and watching all of my stuff because they love me so much. I couldn't even get Leica to repair, to clean and check cameras. And they had them for six months. They wouldn't clean and check my cameras. So even though I shot Leica for 30 years, I have absolutely no relationship with them whatsoever. And I'm baffled by half of the stuff that they do and who they sponsor and who they make films about. But no one's asking me. They do it. I'll be paying full retail and probably get no support. And I don't think they have like a pro services department like a lot of the other brands do. But uh, so be it. That's my take. Here's what I want. I want a 35 millimeter version like everyone does. Uh, I would like a microphone jack. That would be incredibly beneficial for me. I don't need 6K. I don't need 8K. I don't even need 4K. Just give me 1080 with a mic jack. Internal stabilization is nice. Increase the autofocus a little bit. I'd buy it. I don't care if it is six grand. 
I would buy it because if that means I can leave a ton of other stuff at home when I go on these trips, awesome. And I need something that kind of is a throwback mentally to when I was shooting stills all the time. Hang on. Okay, I'm back. Uh, let's see. Okay, point number eight. My goal, immediate goal right now is to get better at filmmaking. I'm here in Maine for a couple of months. I've got a little setup going with a 10-year-old computer inside. My laptop sucks just as bad as it always had. It's useless for doing any kind of films. The battery doesn't hold a charge. The thing overheats. The fan kicks on. It's not designed for doing any kind of filmmaking. And that's 1080. 4K, it just looks at me and says, really? So I got to solve the computer thing first. I got to get better at filmmaking. And it's not like people are out there, like Blurb is saying, hey man, your films suck, you know, you better step it up. They're not saying that. It's just me saying I'm fumbling around because I haven't had the time to like really put in to get better. And I know that filmmaking, like any other language, requires practice and total immersion. And maybe I get a chance to do that here in Maine. I had plans of going into the East Coast cities, Boston, New York, DC, meeting people, doing interviews. I may still do a little bit of that, but with COVID the way it is right now, it's not smart. And also it's so easy to do these things digitally now that uh, in some ways it's even better. I can sit here and cut it and produce it without having to travel and, uh, and also spend budget to get in and out of the cities. Uh, number nine, I don't know if you saw this or not, but the federal government went to the states who are part of the Colorado River Authority. There's seven states, I believe, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Nevada, Colorado, Wyoming. Am I leaving someone out? These are the people, the states that use the Colorado River for water supply. Not all of their water supply, but each state has a certain percentage they're able to pull from the Colorado River. This has been going on forever, but we're in a slight problem here, uh, friends and family. Feds went to the states and said, come up with a plan to cut two to four million cubic feet of water per year because water supplies are no longer secure. Let me explain something to you. If you don't know what an acre foot of water is, an acre foot of water is as it sounds. It's the amount of water required to cover one acre of land one foot deep. It's a lot. The average American uses about 82 gallons of water a day in their home. That's about 30,000 gallons a year. One cubic acre feet of water is about 352,000 gallons. Let's say 300,000 for, 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 for giggles. That's a lot. So for them to cut that two to four million cubic feet. So God knows what that is. I don't have my calculator in front of me, but 352,000 times two, two to four million gallons of water. Do you understand what that means? And they, by the way, the Fed said, if you don't do it, we'll do it for you. And we're just going to stop it, right? So because the dam is no longer going to be able to produce energy if it, if it drops, the water drops too far. And that's where we're headed. That means 20 million people, basically, or more, could be more than that. My math is not so sound. As you know, I got a D in college algebra. That's 20 million people stopping water. People, we are at, again, I've said this a million times. Oh, we got time. Climate change. Yeah, we got time. We don't. It's here. It's been here. And it's about to get super, super real. That is a lot of water. Two to four million cubic feet of water or cubic acres of water. I can't remember. I'm, I, again, I'm discombobulated. Just know it's a ton and the feds went to the states. This got lost because of the January 6th thing. Got lost because of Roe v. Wade. And so it got, you know, this story went out, no one, it was covered, but it really didn't get any traction. And those of us who live in the Southwest were like, uh, that sounds bad. That sounds really bad. So get ready. Uh, the last point I'm going to make before we talk about cocaine, just kidding, threw that in there. This is another good one. Public service announcement. I taught you how to lie initially. Hopefully that comes in handy. You should try it out today on someone you love and see what you can get away with. Last thing we're gonna talk about is ticks. Yes, ticks. As you know, in 2014, September of 2014, I was diagnosed, finally diagnosed with Lyme disease. It took me three months of fighting with uh, health professionals in California to get any kind of treatment, to get any kind of diagnosis. 
They tried to diagnose me with every other disease possible because those were favorable diseases with things like pharmaceutical protocols, but no one would talk to me about Lyme. I got thrown out of doctor's offices. I got told that this was a figment of my imagination, that you couldn't get Lyme in California, all of the same tired, boring stories we've been hearing since 1975. But I'm gonna tell you something. This situation is bad for anyone who's in a place like Maine or New Hampshire or Connecticut or New York or New Jersey or anywhere in New England, really all the way over west of the Great Lakes, you are in the Lyme hot zone. Lyme is all across the country. You can get it in all 50 states. The only place that they really haven't found Lyme is in the polar caps. So if you're anywhere else in the world, this is something to be aware of. You also, ticks here in Maine, they have, they have diseases like Powassan and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Those are equally nasty, often with no real treatment protocols for those. Very deadly, very dangerous diseases. You now have the Lone Star Tick, which affects your, your body's ability to ingest protein. You've got super ticks coming across the border on cattle. If those get into the U.S. livestock system, then food supply is going to be an issue. This is bad. They call ticks one of the first animals that is a, a reflection or insects that's at a reflection of climate change because the winter is no longer killing off ticks like it should. It's not getting cold enough. Anything above 40 degrees, ticks are going to be active, which is most places for most of the year. It's bad. I talk to people all the time. I have people reaching out all the time, asking for help, asking how I got to the health level that I'm at now. I send people to doctors all the time. I get people calling me saying that they're contemplating suicide. It's bad. You know, Lyme is both a phys physical and a cognitive disease. The cognitive side is often worse than the physical side. It is like what I, what I would call my Lyme shadow. If I'm awake, it's there with me. Sometimes it's a bold, dramatic shadow, and other times it's just a whisper, but it's always there. Maine, in the fall, released 86 yearling moose calves. 76 are already dead from ticks. Just let that sink in for a minute. Spoke to a guy up the street. He just got, he tried for 40 years to get a moose tag, which is a, what, what you get when you get a permit to shoot a moose, hunt, go hunt, moose hunting. Very hard to get a tag. 40 years in a row he applied, nothing. The same year, the guy across the street and the guy up the street got a tag at the same time. They went hunting. He said, driving to the moose camp along the road, moose dead from ticks along the side of the road, just covered by hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of ticks that had drained these animals dry. This is happening right now. This has been happening for a while. This is real. If you are anywhere in this area and you go in the woods, you have got to do tick checks. Cover your head. You can often get bitten on your head, in your hair, and you don't see it, you don't realize it. Ticks have a painkiller in their saliva to deaden the point of impact so that you don't feel them biting you. It's a, a beautiful organism. Incredible amount of DNA. One of the most intelligent Lyme bacteria in, in particular has one of the most complex DNA systems out there. It's a, it's a powerful little beast. You want to cover your pants. You want to wear light-colored clothing. You want to do tick inspections. You want to cover those clothes in permethrin and make sure that you keep that up to date so that you're the best defense possible. It's amazing how many people I see wandering around here going through the brush who just don't seem to have any clue. A lot of tourists from the city, a lot of people from other parts of the country. In fact, there's a little hotel down the road was standing in the office one day, this was last year with the owner, car pulls up, and a famous dude lives across the street. So people pull up and they like photograph this landscape where the famous dude has his house. Guy gets out of his car, his little point and shoot, yes, a point and shoot digital camera. So for that, I commend the guy for sticking to his guns. He's getting out, he's trying to frame this up, this horrible photograph up, he's framing, he's framing, he wanders into the bush. I don't say a word, owner goes, Dumbass gonna get Lyme. That was it. It's everywhere. There's tons of sick people here. Everybody seems to have a family member or a friend or both that has Lyme. You have a lot of people who are getting diagnosed after 20, 30 years of having Lyme. And oh, I forgot to mention, my mother has vascular dementia based on undiagnosed Lyme. So my mom has had it for a long, 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 long time. And it's starting to, it not only is starting to affect her brain, it's really impacting her brain. So it's dangerous get checked. If you have any, any, any indication that you were bitten by a tick, do not listen 
to doctors who tell you to wait until you have symptoms to start taking medication. That is a death sentence. Do not do that. If you have any doubt, if you're bitten, get on a standard course of antibiotics immediately. That is my recommendation. I'm not a medical doctor, but it's just so bogus to hear doctors say, wait. If you wait, Lyme is such an amazing organism that will shift from cell wall, cyst, cell, cell, and cell wall. Three versions of the bacteria can morph into your body. It's a spirochete bacteria, which means it corkscrews into the deepest recesses of your brain and body. It is a beast. There is no cure for it. Your goal is to be asymptomatic. The people who get bitten, see the bullseye rash, and get on meds immediately have a damn good chance of getting over it and getting asymptomatic and moving on with their life. I've actually known people that have gotten it multiple times, but saw the tick bite, saw the rash, and immediately got on meds, and they're okay. The rest of us are not, and it can go on, and I'm living proof, it can go on for years, and you guys know me. I run, I cycle, I eat well, I sleep well, I'm healthy, and it destroyed me. I was acutely sick for two and a half years. I was mostly, he's only mostly sick for another two and a half years. And now I have little bouts here and there. I have to constantly in my head monitor what's happening to make sure that it doesn't come back for realsy. And that's it. There will be no talk of cocaine, but we could talk about coastal Maine. I just wrote a blog post about coastal Maine for Blurb. And I went back and culled some images that I'm going to supply to that. I don't really get out and shoot much here. Uh, but I am going to try to make an effort to get out at sunset as much as possible. Jump on my bike. I'm close to the ocean. And get over there and just try to make a frame or two. I don't know. That's it. It's now officially hot and humid in the van. I'm sweating. I've got my, my OD, almost OD brown shirt on here. I dressed up for everyone. I hope that was interesting. What am I doing next? I'm doing my Albania film. I'm doing a Q&A. I have eight questions so far that are really good, so I'll probably do that next. And uh, that's it. Adios. We're sorry, the number you have reached is not in service. Please check the number or try your call again. This is a recording.